Hello there, Project Data Scientists, and welcome to another marvelous Project Data Science tutorial. So if you've been with us before, you know that here at Project Data Science, we're all about learning through doing, which is why all of our tutorials are hands-on. So I expect you, if you can, to be at your computer following along and setting up this environment as we go through the video. This tutorial here is perfect for beginners, but it's also perfect for you if you've just never really found a good data science groove or if you're missing some of these good key pieces like version control, like virtual environments, like GitHub, or if you're not satisfied with your code editor, then this is also going to be good for you. So let's talk about what we're gonna be doing in this tutorial. So first we're gonna set up Python. So there are several different ways that you can install Python and get it going, but I'm gonna show you how I like to do it, which also ties into the virtual environments we're going to be using. We're gonna talk pretty briefly about the terminal. So your terminal is where you can launch Python from, you can run Python files, you can open up your project directory inside of your code editor. You can do a bunch of stuff. It's very powerful. And we'll talk for a minute about that and the terminal that I like to use. We'll talk about the code editor. So in particular, VS Code is what we're gonna be talking about. I will walk you through some of my favorite aspects of the editor and how I like to use it. We'll talk about virtual environments, specifically using Conda. And uh, a, a lot of people don't use virtual environments or they're confused about how to go about using virtual environments, but this is definitely a best practice that I highly, highly encourage you to do. And we'll talk about version control using Git and GitHub. So essentially, how do you track changes to your code over time and make sure that, you know, even if you throw your laptop out of a window, you've still got all of your code stored somewhere safe. And finally, we'll talk about Jupyter Notebooks, where a lot of data science work has moved these days. Jupyter Notebooks are pretty powerful, and we'll talk briefly about how to get those set up. Oh, and, and one more thing. We will talk about how I like to organize my code and how I like to organize my projects which is, I think, a, a very good organizational structure that, that you can also use to make sure that your code is nice and organized. So why did I create this video? Well, this, this slide, I think, shows a little reason why, and nothing against this slide. I think that this definitely is useful in certain ways and you know has a place, but this is pretty overwhelming, right? And if, if you're getting into data science for the first time, or if you've only been in data science for a little bit, this might be kind of what it feels like when you think about how do I set up my coding environment? Like, should I use Python or another language? What what code editor should I use out of the you know hundreds that are out there? Not actually hundreds, but um, what uh, you know sh what what kind of virtual environment should I use? Should I use one of these other online platforms? Like, how do I do all this stuff? And and so this can be incredibly overwhelming which is why I think that wrapping it into kind of this nice package here, just a few things that really get you up and running to a professional level pretty quickly can save you a ton of time. And uh, this is the environment that I use on a daily basis. I mean, this is what professionals use, you know? So it's not like this is gonna be too simplistic. This is gonna set you off with a really great foundation on top of which you can get into the actual data science faster. So that's why I created this. That's why I think you're gonna learn a ton from it and find it really valuable. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so first up is the terminal. And we're not gonna spend a ton of time on this because this can get a little tricky between different operating systems. And uh, the, the default terminal that comes on your computer is probably good enough for you to go ahead and get started with. But I will go ahead and show you what I like to use. And if you're on a Mac or a Linux, then this is gonna be my recommended path here. And if you're not, then uh, hang on just a second. If you're on a Windows, I'll talk about that in just a second. So if you're on a Mac or Linux, 
Um, Zish is a really great shell, and Oh My Zish here is a nice way to install it. So this just comes with a little bit more power than your normal shell might, like Bash. Um, I would recommend giving this a try, but if you want to stick with the default terminal on your computer, so if you go down here and you see terminal here, and this pops up, so here you go, you see actually Oh My Zish is installed. It's the default terminal and mine wants to update right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and let it update. But your default terminal might be running Bash and that is probably fine as well. So you see here my terminal um, gives me just a little bit of nice color schemes and I've got my Conda environment over here on the left. And if I'm in a Git repository, for version control, it shows that as well. And there are some other handy dandy little tricks that you can use with Zish. So I would recommend installing that. Now, if you are on a Windows, I wanna talk about that really quickly. So you're probably fine sticking with the Windows command prompt or PowerShell. So CMD is gonna be your basic command prompt, your basic terminal on a Windows computer. And this actually works a little bit better uh, out of the box with the virtual environment that I'm gonna show you later. Um, but you can, also use, you can also use PowerShell. And this is going to be a, I, and I admittedly don't know a ton about the difference between these two, but I believe PowerShell comes with more advanced configurable programming and scripting and things like that compared with the normal command prompt. But like I said, this doesn't work quite as well with a couple of features uh, about the virtual environment here. So both of these should already be installed on your computer, I believe, if you have a Windows. So I think that these should be a good starting place for you. Try starting out with the, the command prompt, see if that works. I'm also... I'm going to mention a, two other things really quickly for Windows users. One of them is very new as of the time of recording this video. That's the Windows terminal or the Microsoft terminal. So I believe that this is supposed to bring together the kind of the command prompt, PowerShell, and also Linux slash Unix style uh, terminal functionality all within kind of one terminal here. So this is pretty new and I haven't used it, but this could be something worth checking out because honestly, a lot of developers use the Linux style terminal, which is Bash or Zish. And it's gonna be kind of hard to find um, programming support for Windows command line and PowerShell some of the time. This is just due to you know, may, maybe the fact that a lot of the world's uh, servers and websites and everything are run on Linux machines or and a lot of developers use Linux and Mac and Macs are, are built on top of kind of the Linux shell. Um, they have, you know, Bash and they can install Zish and everything. So it's just going to be a little bit harder to find support for Microsoft stuff, which is why something like the, the Windows terminal might help. And that leads me to the last thing, which I'm going to recommend here, which is the, the Linux subsystem for Windows. This is a way to essentially install Linux on your Windows machine and then have access to the normal Bash and Zish style uh, terminal. So if you're on Windows, I'm sorry that I don't have quite as clear of a recommendation here. But, you know, start with the command prompt. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper, I would recommend checking out the terminal, the, the uh, Microsoft terminal and the Linux subsystem for Windows. But either way, let's go back over here to our terminal. I'm going to type clear and I'm going to CD. So I'm in my, I'm in, I'm in my home directory right now. I'm going to CD into a project data science directory that I already have created. I'm going to type ls to list the contents of this directory. And I'm going to make a new project directory here just for this video uh, so that we can walk through a few things. So I'm gonna make, make a new directory. Let's call it data science environment. 
All right, so now if I do an LS, you'll see that we have this new data science environment folder here. I'm going to CD change directories into that data science environment. And if I do another LS, you'll see that there is, there's nothing in here currently. All right, and that wraps up the quick little terminal piece of setting up your data science environment. And by the way, we'll be using the terminal a little bit more throughout this video. So if you've never used it before, you'll get a sense for some of the things that we do with the terminal. But you've already seen, you know, a little bit of it. Um, you can list out your directories and your files. You can make new directories. Uh, this is where you can launch Python and get into an interactive shell. This is where you'll run Jupyter Notebooks from, etc. So there's, you know, we'll talk more about things that you do with the terminal as we go through this video. So next up, let's get Python installed and let's also talk about virtual environments. And we're gonna, gonna kinda do these at the same time because the way that I recommend installing Python and your virtual environment manager is through this thing called Miniconda. So Miniconda is essentially a smaller version of the Anaconda distribution. And the Anaconda distribution is a pretty popular way to install Python and a lot of key data science libraries that you use in Python, like NumPy and Pandas, etc. So Anaconda is pretty big because it includes kind of everything, all of the different scientific libraries that basically anyone might want to use. Um, so Miniconda is a lot smaller, but it includes the key things still that we want. It includes Python, and it includes Conda here, which is the way that we install new packages and the way that we manage our virtual environments. So I would recommend go ahead and, depending on your system, download and install the uh, downloaded and install Miniconda for your computer and make sure to do Python 3.7. That's the way, or um, pretty much everything has migrated to Python 3.7 these days unless you're at a company that is still using Python 2, uh, you know, for some reason, then that's pretty much the only reason you would want to use Python 2 is if, you're, is if your company is currently using it. But otherwise, download Miniconda for Python 3 and get it installed. Now, once you have that installed, you should be able to come back over here to your terminal, and I'm going to exit out and start a new one, just because you might also have to do this to refresh your terminal after installing Miniconda. Let's go back into our folder here that we were in. And you should now have access to Python, and you can, you can test that just by running Python and seeing if it works. And you should see Python 3.7 or Python 3.8 or something like that. And also, if you type which Python, so I have Anaconda installed here, you'll, you'll probably see Miniconda bin Python or something like that. And the which command here just tells you, essentially, you know, if I run the command Python right now, what is it actually going to run? Where is the executable, where is the application that is going to get run when I run Python? And in my case, currently, Python, if I run that, it will run this, Anaconda 3, bin, Python. And this is an important note because of what we're about to do, which is use Conda to create a virtual environment. So let's pop over here to Google really quickly. I'm going to Google, let's try Google virtual environment virtual environment python want to find a quick so all right so this image is kind of small all right yeah this image is kind of small but it demonstrates uh it demonstrates what a virtual environment is good for so let's say that you download mini conda and you install it and you have a version of python installed now and let's say that you install some packages using Miniconda into your main Python installation. So you install NumPy 
and you install pandas and you install a bunch of other stuff from the dark corners of the internet that you found that you think is going to be helpful for your data science project or you know whatever whatever it is that you're doing and now let's say let's actually go back to the example from before that you go to a company and that company has some of their code in python 2.7 well, now what do you do? Do you uninstall Python on your system and reinstall Python 2.7? Well, that's going to break everything that you've been writing in your newer version of Python. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you solve this problem here? Or let's say that you've got two different, two different packages like pandas, maybe, maybe you want to install two different versions of pandas you want to install like the really new version with some cool experimental features but you also want to make sure that you have a stable version of pandas to run some of your previous code with so that things aren't breaking how do you get around that without having you know like a hundred computers sitting around so you can install a hundred different versions of python and these packages on all of them well, that's where virtual environments come in handy. So a virtual environment is essentially just like this image shows two different versions of Python installed in two different directories on your computer. So it keeps them totally separate. You can install different versions of Python. You can install different versions of Python packages. Uh, so this is definitely a best practice, and I'm going to show you how to do that the easiest way right now. So Conda, which you just installed with Miniconda, is the package installation and virtual environment manager. So if we wanted to install a new package like pandas, we could do Conda install pandas. We could do Conda install NumPy or whatever. And if we want to create a new virtual environment, we also do that with Conda. So the, the format for that is Conda create. So you're creating a new virtual environment. You do dash in, and then we're going to give it a name here. So we'll say data science env, so env for environment. So you give it a name. And then whenever you're creating it, you can go ahead and pass it whatever you want to install. So let's install let's install Jupyter to start out with. We'll install Pandas to start out with. And maybe we'll go ahead and install matplotlib and um, Seaborn, which is another data visualization library that I like. So I'm going to hit Enter here. And now Conda is going to figure out what it takes to install these packages that I've just requested. And it's going to go and install a whole new version of Python into a different directory along with these packages. All right, so this says solving environment. It's going to ask us, do we want to proceed with in installing these packages? And you might be wondering, you know, like, hey, why are we installing like a million packages here? I just asked for four packages. So that's because these four packages each rely on other packages. So let's take a look here. So pandas might rely, for example, on pandoc and pandoc filters. And uh, matplotlib might rely on pyqt, for example. So you'll see up here that these are the things that we've asked to install. And these are the things that are going to be installed because they are dependencies. And here's a key thing as well. You'll see this environment location. This is going to create a new virtual environment under the ENVS folder, the ENVS directory and then under data science env. So this is creating a whole other directory where it's going to install Python and it's going to install all of the files for these packages. So let's go ahead and hit yes here. So type Y and hit enter. And I will give this just a minute to install and then we'll be back. All right, so you'll see that this has now finished and it helpfully gives us this little command here. So to activate this virtual environment, 
we just use conda activate data science inv. And this is the part where if you're using Windows, there's a little bit of a difference between PowerShell and the C and CMD, the command prompt. Um, so I have had more luck in the past when I've had to do this with the command prompt, but you know, play around with it, do a little bit of Googling to see which one works best for you or try the whole Windows, Microsoft terminal and the Linux subsystem. But okay, so for now, remember that if I type which Python, this will show me where this Python is going to be executed. So if I do conda activate data science inv, and now I do which Python, you'll see that Python has, the, the version of Python that we're now going to run is the one in this virtual environment folder that we just created, data science inv bin Python. So if I run Python right now, you'll see actually that we have a different version of Python than I had a minute ago whenever I first ran Python in my, my base conda environment. I'm actually using Python 3.8.3 .3 now. So I'm, I'm using a slightly newer version of Python. And if I import pandas as PD, which is how you typically import that, you'll see that, imp that imports successfully. If I try importing, let's try um, requests. So we didn't install requests and it doesn't come as part of the Python standard library. So I don't have access to it uh, because we didn't install it. But if I go back out, so if I do conda deactivate now to deactivate my virtual environment, I type which Python you'll see that I'm running my kind of my base installation Python now. So I think I have requests installed here. I'm not positive, but let's take a look. Yep, there we go. So you'll see that the not only is the version of Python different because we're running Python 3.7 here and we're running it from this folder, but also the data science libraries, the Python libraries that we have installed are gonna be different. I have requests installed in my base installation, but I didn't have it installed in my data science env virtual environment. So you can see that these are two totally separate Python environments, which is the best practice. So anytime you start a new project, I would recommend creating a new virtual environment like this. So I'm going to go ahead and reactivate my virtual environment and we can go ahead and uh, move on to the next step, our code editor. So code editors are definitely, that's, that's one of those subjects where people can get into fights about it because people have strong feelings. Um, but I have seen a lot of movement in recent years actually towards this editor. Uh, not everyone is using it, of course, but a lot of people are using it. Uh, I use it personally, and I've used different editors before. Visual Studio Code. So this is a great code editor. Uh, it comes with a lot of functionality right out of the box. And then you've got these extensions that you can use to install pretty much anything else that you want. It's nice and easy to use, very clean, very, uh, very beautiful, and kind of, you know, streamlined. So... I would recommend starting out with VS Code unless you already have another editor that you prefer. So go ahead and download and install VS Code. And then I will show you some of my favorite bits of functionality about it. So after you have VS Code installed, you can go back over here to your terminal and you might have to re, you might have to uh, exit and come back in again. I'm not sure. But after that, if you come into your folder here, your project directory that we created, and type code uh, for VS Code, and then period for the current directory, what you're doing is you're telling VS Code to open up a new window inside this current directory to say, hey, this is my project. I want to do some work on my project. Let's open up this folder. So whenever I first open it up, you'll see that there's kind of nothing, nothing going on here. So these tabs on the left, 
This top one shows you the, this is the file explorer. So the data science environment, this is the folder we're currently in. I'll go ahead and right click here and create a new file just so that we have some file to look at. So I'll call this, uh, you know, test.py for Python. And you'll see that it immediately recognizes it as a Python script. It pops open this little, uh, this, it, this Python logo right here. Here is our file. Down here in the bottom right, you'll see that the syntax highlighting or the language mode is Python. And if we start typing things like import pandas as PD, it does syntax highlighting for us. So that is pretty cool. Now we've got some other things over here on the left. You've got some search. Um, this is for source control, which we'll get to in just a little bit. You've got kind of a runner and debugger. And then this is the main place that I want to point you to right now. This is the extensions tab. So this is where you can install anything that you want that does not come with VS code right out of the box. So for example, I have kind of an additional Python uh, extension installed here, which helps with some things like linting and debugging. I also have a Docker extension installed, which gives me this extra little tab where I can check out my Docker containers and see if they're running. And if you don't know what that is, you know, no worries. So, and this also has various uh, extensions for databases. If there's a certain database that you connect to, you can find an extension for it. Um, all kinds of cool things there. So you can browse around for these. So let me show you a couple of my other favorite parts about VS Code. So if I go up here to Terminal, we can actually launch a terminal directly in VS Code. And not only that, well, let's see. So it's automatically activating this other virtual environment for me right now, which is controlled down here on the bottom left. I am going to change this to data science env. So I'm going to change the default virtual environment for this directory. And you'll see that VS Code just popped up a little folder with a settings thing, a settings file that basically says, hey, this is the virtual environment I want to use for this directory. So it will automatically remember that whenever I start new terminals in the future. Let's actually, let's just go ahead and try that really quick. Let's start a new terminal. Let's see if it does the right thing. Yep, there we go. So it automatically activates our correct virtual environment for us. So we can have a terminal here, and this is very helpful for if, you know, let's say I want to, I want to type up some Python here in a script and then I wanna test it, then down here in the terminal, I can just do, let's see, uh, let's take a look in our environment here, or sorry, in our directory, test.py. So I do Python, Python, test.py, and it prints hello world. So we have kind of all in one window, we have a way that we can write code, and we can also run it down here. And you can also have, I can, I can open up IPython down here and have an interactive Python shell open where I can test things out while I'm creating scripts. So let's say there's something I don't know how to do or I'm confused as to what the results are going to be. I can have interactive Python. I can have IPython running down here, test out whatever I want to test out, and then move it up here into a more permanent script. Now, not only that, I can go to terminal, split terminal, and now I've got two terminals going on. Look at that, that's a pretty crazy. So uh, now, not only can I experiment with Python in the left side, but I can also run my Python scripts in the right side and I can do anything else that you might want to do with the terminal over on this right side as well, like uh, like version control using git, which is something we will uh, get to haha, in just 
a minute. So these are some of my favorite features of VS Code. Obviously, there's a lot more that you can discover by exploring. But if nothing else, I would start out with this by opening up your project directory inside VS Code. Uh, have open your scripts and whatever else you want. And then have open, if you need, an interactive Python terminal over here and just a normal terminal on this side. So I'll go ahead and exit out of this terminal, exit out, clear that, and we'll keep this around for later usage. Oh, one last thing that I want to mention before we move on is the command shift P shortcut. So command shift P, and if you're on a Windows, uh, that might be control shift P for you. But command shift P opens up this launch uh, search function, essentially, where you can basically search for any functionality that you want. So if I want to change the syntax, um, let's see, I think I might be able to do that here. Syn syntax, maybe, maybe not sure. If actually, so I usually change the syntax down here in the bottom right, but one thing that I, that I use this for, for example, is let's say you've got some text and you want to change this to uppercase. Command shift P, search for uppercase, transform to uppercase. Boom. There you go. Let's say I have some text. I've got some text here. E, you know, this doesn't necessarily, um, let's, you know, we've got some bins, we got dogs, whatever. This doesn't make any sense, but apples and elephants. And I want to sort these. Well, does VS Code have a sort functionality? Let me check. Command Shift P, sort, sort lines ascending. Boom. There we go. And now all of our text is sorted. So anytime you're looking for something and you're like, huh, I wonder if I can do this right now, you know, check out Command Shift P and take a look to see if it's in here. Cause you can, you know, scroll through and see there's a ton of different stuff that you can do, but all right. And actually I lied one more thing that I'm going to show you before we move on. And that is multiple cursors. So if you click somewhere and then you use the, on a Mac, it's the option key. I'm not sure what it would be on windows, but um, use the option key and click. Well, now I've just created multiple cursors and I can type in multiple things at the same time. So, uh, and I can even copy paste multiple things at the same time. So I can do stuff like this, or if I was, you know, typing some Python and I wanted to turn this into, uh, you know, like some dictionary or something. Maybe I create a dictionary up here and then I create multiple cursors, option, click, option, click, option, click. I'm going to select these four lines. I'm going to use the double quote to wrap these in double quotes. And I'm going to set some kind of key equal to this, maybe just the first, uh, first three letters here or something like that. And there we go. With not that much typing, I was just able to turn four different lines into uh, actual code here by typing something on every single line. So multi-line select is very, very useful. So you can do option click. Another way to do it is you can do command option and then like the down arrow, for example, will move your cursor down and do multiple selections. You can also, and this is, this is probably too much information at this point, but I want to show you just because it's cool. You can select a word and then do command D and that will select the next instance of the word. And then you've got a multiple cursor there. So, or let's say that I want to select this equal sign, then I can do uh, command D and now I'm selecting all four of these space equal spaces. And then I can go here and, you know, 
edit stuff however I want to. So those are a couple tricks that will save you a ton of time as you are coding in VS Code. All right, just a few more things to go here to finish getting your environment set up and a few more things to walk you through as far as using all of this together. So let's go back over to Chrome here. And we're going to talk about version control now. So version control is essentially a way to... Uh, this is a pretty deep topic here, so you're going to want to do some research. But it's essentially a way to keep track of each time your code changes. So you know how you can save a document and that creates a little checkpoint um, or it, you know, it makes sure that, your, that your, your edits get saved into the file. Version control is like that, but a lot more powerful. Not only can you save your code like we might do with a file, but you can actually take snapshots of it at any given point in time so that if you ever want to get back to like let's say this exact file then you can do that and if you're collaborating on code with a bunch of other people and you know like let's say i'm working on my function here and i'm i'm trying to write a function and you know someone else uh this is like sarah's function over here and Sarah is trying to work on this, we can both work on code on our separate computers and then eventually combine them together in the same file. And version control is what helps us do that. So I am going to recommend that you install Git, Git, G-I-T, and then get an account set up on GitHub. So first things first, if you Google GitHub, install git there is this set up git uh, so github basically has like a lot of really helpful resources for using git and just just to explain really quick what this is so git is the underlying software that does the version control github is a website where you can store your code that has been tracked using Git. So GitHub is basically a way to help you track your code and um, store it online using Git, but Git is the underlying software that you're going to be using on your computer to actually track everything. So step number one would be to download and install the latest version of Git. So if we click on that link, should be pretty straightforward. You just download, you know, whichever version of these for your operating system and get it installed. And then I would come to come back to the setup page and let's see, set your username. So you can set a git username here and then set your commit email address. So, do, 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 git config. So these are things that you do via the terminal. So I would just follow these instructions on GitHub. So download and install Git, follow these other two instructions, and then go ahead and create a GitHub account as well. Now, once you have Git installed and you've set up a, Git, a GitHub account, if you come back over here to your environment, the way that we start tracking our code in uh, for this project is in a terminal, we would type git init. So we create, and you'll see here, initialized empty git repository. And that essentially means, what that basically means is, hey, git is going to start tracking your code changes now whenever you tell it to. So git does not do anything unless we tell it to. So let's tell it to do something. So first things first, I'm gonna create two files that you'll typically find in most Git rep uh, repos or repositories. That's the readme here. And this is gonna be something like this. It looks like, uh, you know, my 
data science environment. Um, this is a helper readme file with information about what is in this project. And this is what will be displayed on GitHub. This is essentially just a text file that you can format. So this, this little uh, hashtag pound symbol there means give me a big heading. Um, and this is just a way of kind of writing up some information about what is in this repository. So the readme is one file that you'll typically find in every Git repository. And the other is this thing called a dot git ignore. Now dot git ignore, this is where you put any directories or any files of things that you do not want to track in uh, using git. So in this case, I do not want to track this dot vs code directory because this just has settings that are relevant to my specific computer and to the fact that I'm using VS code. And, you know, if I want to share this code with other people, maybe they're not using VS code uh, and they're not going to have, uh, let's see, they're not going to have the same path here that I would for my environment. So, you know, maybe I want to ignore this folder. So what I do in here is I would just type dot VS code to say, hey, git, ignore this directory. I save it, and then you'll notice here, helpfully, very helpfully, on the left-hand side, VS Code has grayed out this directory. So it's essentially telling us, hey, your Git is not going to track this directory. Now, I come back over here to my terminal. I have, a, I have initialized an empty Git repository. Uh, so we have the ability to keep track of changes now. Now I'm going to run git status to take a look at everything that's changed. Well, we have three files that we have not started tracking yet. So I'm going to add those files and I'm going to add all of the changes that have been made in them by using the period syntax here, the period notation, which just means add everything inside of my folder. Now, if I run git status, um, so we haven't actually taken a snapshot yet. We've just told Git that we're thinking about taking a snapshot and that these are the files that we are thinking about taking a snapshot of in order to track their changes. So changes to be committed. Committed here means basically taking a snapshot. And now I type git commit and I'm gonna add a comment message for this commit. So I'm going to say, essentially, what am I doing? Well, I'll just call this my first commit. So I commit it. Now we have taken a snapshot of th these three files at this specific time uh, when they look exactly like this. Now the last piece of version control that I'm going to show you really quickly is if we want to store this code now and we want to store the history of all of these snapshots. So like, let's say, you know, that I, that I make a change here. Maybe I'm going to add, you know, maybe Mike's function and I save it. So now I run a get status. You'll see that test.py has been modified. So I'm going to stage it. I'm going to get it ready to take it to take a snapshot by adding it to the staging area. And now I'm going to run git commit and I'm going to say add a placeholder function for Mike. All right. And I've just taken another snapshot of our file here. And if I run git log, you'll be able to see two different snapshot. These just, these just uh, list the um, comments that we made here for the snapshots. But we get to see, you know, when, did, when was the snapshot made? Who made the snapshot? What was the message, et cetera. So I'll type Q to get back out of here. And the last thing we're going to do here with version control is push 
this code up to GitLab, or uh, sorry, GitHub. GitLab is a is another another software. So we're going to make sure that this code gets pushed to GitHub so that it is stored safely online. So if I were to throw my computer out a window, my code would still be safely stored on GitHub. So let me go here. We'll go to github.com. I am going to go up here to the top right and create a new repository from that plus symbol. The repository name, let's create, uh, let, let's say demo data sci um, project, demo data sci project. And I can say, you know, this is a demo data science project. All right. I'll leave this public for now. That's totally fine. You can also make it private if you want. And then we are already created a readme and a git ignore. So we are going to skip both of these. I'm going to create the repository. So this is a place where we can store our code that we just created on our computer. So GitHub tells you how to do this, which is very nice. Um, we already have an existing repository. So I'm going to copy this line here. So git remote add origin, and basically this just tells our terminal where to send the code to. And in this case, we're sending it to this link or to this git repository. And then we use this git push, um, this git push line here to push up our code to GitHub. All right, looks like it pushed successfully. If you're doing this for the first time, you'll probably have to enter your password, your username and password, or actually maybe just your password here. So you'll see that after a bunch of lines, we just pushed up our code to GitHub. I come back over here, I refresh my tab in Chrome, and here are my three files. My git ignore, let's go in there. So you just see .vs code, which is the same as the file we have on, on my computer. My readme, and you'll notice actually, this readme section down here, that's what this does, is this readme.md for markdown creates a nicely formatted little description down here on the repository itself so that you can uh, give information about what the repo is. Let, let's actually go, let's try to find something really quick. Um, let's say maybe Python pandas GitHub. So if we go to the pandas repository and scroll down, you'll see that they have all kinds of stuff. They've got a nice image up here. They've got all these little badges. They've got a description of what Pandas is. They've got a um, list of features and links. They've got how to install it. So you can do all of this kind of stuff inside of your readme.md file. And then finally, we have our test.py, our Python script here. And you'll see that this is what we created. So there is a ton more to learn about version control, but that's version control in a nutshell, how you get it set up, how you start using it. And uh, this is definitely something that pretty much all data scientists are going to do and going to use, is they're gonna use Git and they're going to use GitHub or something like GitHub, but very, very often GitHub. So. I just got you started with it, but I would suggest learning more and using it. You know, you you learn through doing. So just uh, just dive in. All right, and I believe we have one or two more things. So first, we'll look at Jupyter notebooks, and then we will. I'll show you how I like to start setting up my project directory structure over here to keep everything nice and organized. And then I think that we might be done. We might be done. So 
Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we installed Jupyter when we created this virtual environment. So if I type which Jupyter, you'll see that the Jupyter executable, the Jupyter application here that we're going to run is inside of our virtual environment folder, which is exactly what we want. So the way that I run Jupyter Notebooks is you just type in Jupyter Notebook, and then I like to use this little ampersand after Jupyter Notebook. And what this does is Jupyter Notebook has to keep running inside of your terminal. And if you, uh, if you don't run it with the ampersand, then this terminal essentially becomes unusable because Jupyter Notebook is occupying the whole thing. It's running inside this terminal. If you use the ampersand, this creates it as a background task or a background job. And then you can keep using this terminal for other things like version control. So I run that. Jupyter Notebook launches over here on my other screen. So I'm going to drag it over. And here we go. This is what Jupyter Notebooks looks like when it launches. And from here, you can go over here to this right hand side, click new Python three notebook. And now you have, we can say uh, my new Jupyter Notebook. You have a new Jupyter Notebook where you can write code like print hello world. And you can also create markdown just like the markdown in GitHub. So you can say uh, here, is, uh, you can say, you know, my project. Here is some information about my project. And then you can do Python code. And uh, not, not very complicated Python code that we're doing right here, but you know, just to get you started to get you into it. So I'll go ahead and save this notebook here. Close out of it. You'll see that we have a new notebook created right here. I can click on it and shut it down. It's not necessary as long as you save your notebook, but you know, you can basically just say, Hey, I'm not using this notebook anymore. Let's go ahead and, and shut down the Python kernel that's running inside of there. So your, your version of Python that's running in there. I'll go ahead and come back over here to VS code and my terminal. You'll see a bunch of output from the uh, on the terminal from Jupyter Notebooks talking about what Jupyter Notebooks is doing. But if I hit enter, if I hit return here, you'll see that this terminal is still usable. Um, and that's what the ampersand, that's what the and did at the end of Jupyter Notebook up here was make it so that this terminal is still usable. Now, Let's do a couple of other things to wrap up here and to get our project directory looking good. I'm going to shut down Jupyter Notebooks. And the way I do that is I'll type jobs here to see that Jupyter Notebooks is in fact running. And then I'm going to type kill and then uh, the percent sign. So the percent sign and then one. And that is going to kill this kind of this first job here and you'll see, okay, the notebook is shutting down. The job is killed. So if we type jobs, there are no longer any jobs running. So Jupyter notebooks is shut down. If I come back over here to where our Jupyter notebooks was running, you'll notice a uh, local host. This just means it's running on your computer at this port. So if I click refresh, well, we just shut Jupyter Notebooks down. So this makes sense that we can no longer access it. All right, I'll come back over here. Let's check our Git status. So Git status. Well, we just added a new Jupyter Notebook. So that's pretty cool. We also added this checkpoints directory. This is another thing that I don't necessarily want to track in version control. So I'm going to add this directory to my gitignore. Now I run git status. 
you'll see that I've modified my gitignore file and I've added a new Jupyter notebook file. Let's just add everything by using the git add period. Well, actually, I'll add these one at a time. So I'll add gitignore. I will commit that with a message that says add uh, add Jupyter notebook checkpoints to git ignore. I'll run git status again, and you'll see that okay, we just we just took care of snapshotting our git ignore file, but we still need to track and snapshot our notebook. So I will add our notebook here, run a little git status. We have staged that. It's looking like it's ready to be committed. So git commit, and we'll say first commit of new notebook. And I'm going to go ahead and git push origin master to get my code onto GitHub. Let's go ahead and come over here and uh, let's just take a look. Oh, I think actually we have it already open over here. Yeah, we do. All right. So I'll refresh my repo here and you'll see that there we go. We have our new notebook up here. So that is nice and tracked using Git and GitHub. All right, one last piece of information here and then I think we will call it quits for the day. And that is how to set up the directory structure for a new data science project. So I will show you one of my favorite resources, and that is Cookie Cutter Data Science. So if you Google Cookie Cutter Data Science, you'll find this page here, which is basically just, as it says, a logical, reasonably standardized, but flexible project structure for doing and sharing data science work. I do think that this is a pretty nice project structure. So I use pieces of it. I typically don't use kind of the full thing here, but I use pieces of it. And I'll show you the main pieces that I like to use. So this is showing the directory structure as well as what the directories are used for. So for example, we have a data folder up here, which is used, unsurprisingly, for your data. You've got the raw data, you've got your data from third-party sources, etc. You have a notebooks folder. So this one is gonna be used for your Jupyter notebooks. And then you'll keep a lot or, you know, almost all of your Python scripts, you know, the non-Jupyter notebook Python code that you write, inside of the source folder, SRC. And your source folder is broken up into different subfolders based on what the code does. So data, features, models, visualization, etc. So let's come back over here to VS Code. And I will, I could do this either in the terminal or over here on the left. Maybe let's do a mixture. So. I'll right click, I'll say new folder, let's create the source folder. And let's move the test.py into the source folder. There we go, so our source folder now has test.py in it. Now I'll come down here to my terminal for this next one. Let's make a new folder or a directory, let's call it notebooks. And you'll see the notebooks folder pop up here on the left. And now let's move MV, the Jupyter Notebook, into the Notebooks folder. And you'll see that up here on the left, the notebook just popped into the Notebooks folder here. And uh, as a very last thing, let's just make dir data. So let's make our data directory. And our project structure is looking pretty good here, pretty good. And, you know, if I want to create, let's just create a little placeholder file. You know, we don't actually have data here, but you know, if we had a CSV file, maybe like mydata.csv. So you'll see now that 
these folders are green, which means that they have been changed uh, since we have taken a snapshot with git. So if I do git status, you'll see that it thinks that we've deleted a couple files. We haven't deleted them. We've really just moved them into these untracked folders. So let's go ahead and add everything and then git status. All right, well now, Git is pretty smart actually, it's pretty smart. So it just, it, it just uh, told us essentially that it thinks we renamed or we moved this file into this folder, which we did, so that's pretty smart. And we also moved this file into this folder. And we're also going to track our data. Well, we actually usually don't want to add our data to version control because data can get pretty big. So I'm going to add our data folder to dot git ignore. But we have a problem and that's just that we we added our data folder already. We already staged it to be snapshotted. So let's go ahead and do a git reset. So I'll do a git reset and that unstages everything. So now if I, if I do a git status, you'll see that our data folder is no longer untracked because it's being ignored by our git ignore. So if we add everything and then run a git status, you'll see, okay, we renamed this, we renamed this, and instead of our data folder here, we see that we modified our git ignore file to include the data folder here. So I will commit this and we'll say create a new notebook and organize the project. I'll push this on up to GitHub. Come over here to GitHub, take a look and make sure that everything got organized. There it is, we're looking pretty good. And with that, I think you now have a really solid working data science environment. So this is what I use on a daily basis. I use, I use Zish as my terminal. I use VS Code to do my code editing. I create Conda environments and install things there. I use Git to do my version control. I use Jupyter Notebooks to do code explore or to, to do like data exploration and modeling and things like that. And I use this cookie cutter data science project uh, directory structure to keep everything nice and structured. So you now have a, a beautiful data science environment that you can use and not have to worry about you know a billion different ways to set this up so i think you're in a really good place um i hope that this really helps you get started with data science and i hope that you have fun learning because you know data science just like any other technological field these days is constantly evolving there is always something new to learn and you know, we're going to be learning new things for the rest of our lives. So enjoy that process. And I hope that this has helped to get you started. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Hope you've learned something and we'll see you later.